All right. I had to turn off the inflation on this thing because it makes a lot of noise. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. How's everybody doing in here? Pretty good? Yeah. Uh, just, uh, just queuing up some slides, I think. So, uh, have you guys been enjoying the EOS Pavilion? It's kind of the funnest place here in the conference, I think. You know, there's uh, we, we've got a lot of stuffed animals and fun things and purple carpet and giveaways. So, uh, it's kind of a good place, good place to hang. So thank you for sticking around today. Um, let's just see how things are going here. I'm going to give a little talk about privacy, and um, and you know, sort of to take a look at how we can make privacy easier for everyone in a couple different ways, and also talk a little bit about the history of privacy. So the title of my talk is "Privacy Should Be a Lot Easier for Everyone," or also, secure everything using your EOS account. So we're going to explore different ways that EOS accounts can be used to enhance your privacy and also the importance of privacy. Uh, first of all, a little history about privacy. It hasn't been around that long. You know, I mean, we just we only had walls for 500 years, uh, private walls. Then the next level of privacy was silent reading. People being able to study privately was a huge, uh, huge movement that happened because the church was. Uh, essentially um, being really tough on people who weren't studying the Bible. So the idea that people could be studying the Bible in private made it so that the church didn't really know if you were studying the Bible or, Bible or not. And so you could not, be, um, could not be punished. Then solo beds, another uh, big level in privacy, 1700. People used to share one giant bed, your entire family, guests, everyone was in a bed together. Uh, that's pretty awkward. Um, then information privacy started to become um, prevalent in the 1900s, and you know, sort of like the idea that we can voluntarily opt in or out of web tracking in 2015 for the first time. But ultimately, you know, we are uh, we're going from living in a paper world to a increasingly an increasingly digital world, and so now in this digital world, the uh, the level of privacy that we have day to day it's 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 pretty low. We're being tracked on our phones uh, constantly. Uh, you, you know, you can barely even open a newspaper or, or you know look at the news without seeing some huge data breaches that are happening. This is just from today. Um, as you can see here, there's several different articles here about different data breaches that are happening in technology right now today. So this is a massive, massive issue, and essentially, you know, privacy is totally dead due to the centralization that we've had of all of our data. Basically, the internet's broken. Brock always talks about this, and you know, it's, it's fundamentally flawed. The systems are super flawed. They're very hard to use, and the, e the easiest systems are incredibly exposed. So, you know, now we have blockchain has a lot of potential. I mean, it's a very public ledger, but it's a public ledger of cryptographic keys. So we may not want to store everything we do on the blockchain. Hey, I had lunch. Hey, you know, I, now I went, to, I went to meet up with a friend. Oh, I drove my car from here to there. We may not want all that data to be public. I certainly don't, right? But the idea that we have these keys and they can be accessed so easily gives us a lot of opportunities. Um, you know, because it, keys allows to encrypt things. Encryption is like a big digital envelope. You gotta think about like how, how letters used to work. Basically postcards, you know, developed as a way to send people information. And then someone came up with this idea to wrap it with, a nut, with something else so that not everyone could read it as it went all the way across the world to another person. And so it really doesn't matter where our data lives if we have good encryption on it, right? Like, it's a really strong envelope to protect almost anything. Um, you know, but blockchains are super complicated. It's a huge barrier to adoption. We can look at, here's three transactions. Here's a Bitcoin transaction, here's a Ethereum transaction, here's a Tron transaction. These are three different transactions, the from and the to. And as you can see here, it's very complicated. These addresses are incredibly hard to read. You know, there's, there's really unlikely that anyone could ever remember these or tell someone what their address is on these chains if someone wants to send them something encrypted. Um, EOS does a much better job of this by allowing you to have account names so we all have account names on EOS. Your EOS account name is a 12-letter uh, human readable name. This is unicorn magic. 
That's Crystal's account sending me a thousand sense tokens for video verifying myself in chat. And so you can see how much simpler this is making the idea of being able to have encrypted communication, which is something that we actually do in sense chat using EOS accounts. It's very easy. You can send me a totally encrypted message at Ben Makes Sense that no one will ever be able to read except for you and me. And so, you know, EOS accounts are super interesting. They're basically permissions databases. And uh, this is kind of technical, but um, they, it's records of permissions to do certain things digitally, is essentially what I would say. And uh, it makes it very easy to do complex, super complicated permission stuff, which is also uh, really useful if you want to have a lot of different keys for different things. Uh, here's EOS DAC, for instance, like there's, there's permissions actually get chosen by elections. So this is like crazy. I mean, they have, they have four or five different levels. Like it, it's, it's really complex, but it's, it's, it's all at the base layer of EOS that allows them to build things like this. So it's simple for them to build, but it's really complex to understand. Um, you know, EOS wallets also make, uh, make authentication really easy. My video's not gonna play, but what, what this would show is that you basically click a button and you can log into different web services using EOS. It's, uh, it's incredible. Like, in terms of blockchain stuff, like, there's just nothing this easy in blockchain. And to not have a centralized service that you can authenticate with, it's really, really incredible. So like, I've been doing some thinking about what else can we do with Neil's account? What else can we protect? What else can we secure? Uh, so I have some different ideas about, there's a whole slew of things we can do with, with our keys and with, uh, with shared secrets, which is uh, basically a key that you create between two accounts. And so you know, we can do lots of things with identity, identification and verification. Here's a DNS system that's running on EOS, it's live now. It requires a browser plugin, but it does not use any servers that are centralized. It uses the block producers. It's all on-chain records of DNS, which I think is really, really cool. Um, public key infrastructure, another really broken area of the internet, can also be improved. Um, we can sign stuff. We can secure authentication of things, like other things that aren't web-based, like SSH encryption. Um, at Sense, we encrypt messages, like I was saying. So what we do at Sense is, between two peers, we generate a shared secret. We use that shared secret to encrypt the messages. And that shared secret makes sure that only the message can only be read by the recipient and the sender. So it literally doesn't even matter. Even if we store your data, which we don't, but we would never be able to read it because we don't have your key. You have your key. You can change your key anytime you want in Sense in your EOS account and import it, and you'll get brand new encryption secrets every time. So uh, this is really, really cool. Um, this the encryption algorithm that we came up with works really well. Um, what else can we do? We can encrypt files. We can encrypt calendar invites. We can encrypt voicemails, uh, voice notes. But I think uh, encrypting email is particularly interesting because communications are really, uh, really out there. You know, when we use Gmail or Office 365, the servers keep your data in plain text. That means they're reading it. They may not be reading each one. And the danger is not you being targeted as an individual, but the danger is where they're reading all of our emails. And what they're doing is they're learning a lot about where we are, what we do, who we talk to. And they're using that data against us. You know, they're using it to target us in different ways, not just with ads, but to manipulate us. And it's undermining freedom and democracy. So I think really email is uh, something that just we need better and easier tools to use to encrypt it. So we have a tool called PGP. Wow, it's great. It's from the 1990s. Uh, this guy, Phil Zimmerman, built it. It's the idea of giving military grade protection for everyday people, but everyday people you know, really, thank you, Phil, but I mean, people really cannot use PGP. Um, it's got a lot of problems with it. But it's a very smart system. This is a great graphic that displays, that shows you how PGP works, where it generates a random key, encrypts your data with that random key, and then encrypts that key and your data, and then sends it with another public key that someone has. All of that in a little package. Works very similarly to what we're doing with Sense. But you know, like, PGP, this is, the, this is an example of a key on PGP. So you'd have to have my PGP key if you want to send me a PGP encrypted email. And look at this thing. I mean, you could, I could obviously send it to you, you copy paste it, but it's very hard to remember 
Um, it totally, this system totally breaks what's called Kirchhoff's sixth principle on security, which is it has to be something easy to use, it has to be seamless for users. If they're actually going to use some kind of security, it has to be just as easy as not using it. Um, yeah, there's administrative nightmares. The technology is very bad, it's very old. Um, the compression is bad. Um, you know, the, the, the subject header is not encrypted, the sender and recipient also not encrypted with PGP emails, which means you can be tracked using PGP, and now you're even more of a target potentially because we can say, like, oh, uh, you know, uh, Dallas and Ben are using PGP to communicate. That can be tracked on the whole public networks. Now, we're really curious about what they're, what they're talking about, and anytime they're not using PGP, you better be sure we're going to double this into that. Right? So it totally makes you a target. But you know, I think that there's a really good opportunity to leverage EOS accounts for email encryption because they're super simple, because we can have an online public database of keys, and um, you know, we can attach an email address to an EOS account through some verification contract, and uh, we can record the email account to attach that EOS account on chain. And then you can send and receive emails using any backend. Uh, you can use Gmail or whatever you normally use with a small plugin that would just reference your keys and do a PGP like encryption, but super simple. And that way it would know if anyone's using it, they would use it automatically. If anyone's not using it, you wouldn't be you would have to do anything different. So it's one of the one of the cool ideas that I've thought of recently. And then we can have uh, we can send emails totally encrypted with no gods and no masters. Right? Because a lot of encryption protocols now rely on an administrator, and that administrator ultimately has some power or control over your keys. You know, the companies you work for or whatever will be able to read your emails. So, it's not a great system. Um, oh, wait. Yeah, so the idea is we can replace PGP with uh, EOS privacy envelopes, um, just like I was saying. The database provides, uh, blockchain database provides an untamperable record of keys, so there's no web of trust required, uh, which is a thing of PGP. Requires like a social network, like you're connected to you, and then the keys have different levels of trust based on how much they've been used, and it's a flawed system. Um, you know, but, but this also allows HIPAA compliant emails on any email platform, because they've encrypted at rest and in transit, so that's also pretty neat. Um, we would still need a way to, do, to obscure the center recipient, but I don't think it would be hard to do. Uh, totally reasonable to consider. And so, you know, privacy essentially, privacy is important. Download SenseChat, use SenseChat for your communications. You know, even if you're not talking about something that you might think needs to be private, there's a lot of reasons that privacy is important in our world. You know, like we are giving away freely of our data, we're under mass surveillance. You know, it's, it's known more than ever. If you've seen Snowden talk about it, it is insane the amount of surveillance that's happening. <coughs> and it may not seem like it impacts our daily lives right now. You know, we've seen some things in the elections about it, but it, I guarantee you it's going to become more of an issue unless we do something now using like, using like this. So, thank you guys very much. Thank you.